everybody for rebuilding. Not build back better, but rebuilding. Anybody catch that? If not, you need to pay attention to the news just a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. Because we're trying to get that BBB canceled in the, con in the Senate. It's got a lot of bad stuff in it for everybody. And especially this nation. And we just blessed Joe Manchin and I think cinema may still be standing against it. We bless them to have a fortitude to, to block that. They're Democrats, but they apparently care a little more about our country than they do the party. So uh, we, uh, we don't want that to pass. I don't think it's going to pass before Christmas. They were trying to get it passed. But um, I asked Joe to tell a joke before I got up here to kind of set me up. But uh, I even gave her the joke. No. Uh, she for sure wouldn't tell it if I gave her the joke. But um, I want to speak to you about refueling your joy tank. And I would really like to be a stand-up comedian and just get you all laughing, but I'm not. And, and I want to give you some scriptures. And um, I'm trusting the uh, anointing of the Lord to impart a joy as I'm sharing the truth of it. And often he does that. You know, you get, many times you get what you preach. So the, the preachers that preach against sin all the time, I'm like going, I think you better be cautious about that. I would rather preach the power and the revival and the glory of God coming. And, but we do have to address things like that. But, um, you know, uh, Philippians 4.8 says, meditate on these things. Whatsoever is lowly, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is noble and good report. It doesn't say you shouldn't pay attention to the things that are negative. You've got to know what's going on, but you shouldn't meditate on them. So we've got to keep uh, meditating on the good things. And um, I think we're in a day when that's, that's, that can be challenging. In fact, while Dan was speaking, I, I felt the Lord say, I'm going to um, round up or gather up all the straws that are breaking the camel's back. How many times have you used that phrase? And I grew up with these kind of phraseologies that my mother was big on it, you know. Put your no, uh, shoulder to the grinds on the shoulder, the nose to the grind on the shoulder to the wheel. You know, she had all these sayings. You knew, you knew what they meant. <laughs> sauce for the goose, sauce for the gander. And you probably had to grow up on a farm to know a lot of them, what they meant. But my mother used them all the time. And so uh, we used one, and I used it just the other day, the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, the camel's carrying a load. And he's doing okay, and he's slugging away. But he's, he's so close to his brink of exhaustion or collapse that just that last little straw that somebody drops on his back says it was a straw that broke the camel's back. And I've noticed in the day we live in that there are a lot more straws. And um, I just got over that one. It was, a, it was just a little thing. People said, well, what's his problem? You know, that was just a little thing. We didn't realize I was already loaded right up to the, right up to the limit, you know. <laughs> so have a lot of grace for people in the season we're in. But Jesus is about the business of removing the straws or giving us the grace to even handle straw after straw after straw. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 12, I want to read there. And it's, uh, again, a synopsis of the Christmas story that contains two sets of characters we didn't talk about last time, but the shepherds and the angels. And it says, um, starting in verse 8, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Got a little echo up here if I can get that turned down. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before, before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were great, greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. He is first of all a Savior, which is expressed in His name Jesus. He's then Christ, the anointed of God, the Messiah of Israel. And finally, He's the Lord. He's God manifested as human, in fact, he's perfect theology that has now been introduced into the earth in infant form. And so as Jesus grows up in wisdom and knowledge and favor with God and man, it says as he walks out his life's calling, ultimately makes provision for our salvation and our reconciliation to God. 
As he does all that, he becomes God's message in the earth that clarifies what God's really like. It's not that what was being said by the prophets was inaccurate. It was just inadequate. And so it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, that God spoke to our fathers in the past days uh, at various times and in various ways through the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, who is His express image. And so He gave us a message through a life that was lived out in front of us, captured in the Scriptures for us, so that he is, uh, Bill Johnson, I heard, I think the first time I heard the phrase coined, called him perfect theology. And so when you study Jesus, you're studying perfect theology of God. And uh, I think that's just a good, a good way to say it, a good way to put it. But I'm reminded today of Nehemiah 8 in the last part of verse 10. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And he says that in a, in a situation where the people uh, have found the Word of God and it's being read to them by the, the uh, priests and explained to them and they realized how far they'd gotten off track, which was good. And in their repentance, they began to weep and they were brokenhearted as the Word was being read to them and the, and the uh, priests and the I believe the king began to say to them, this is not a day for weeping. This is a day for rejoicing. This is a day for joy. Uh, go home and feast. And you know there's more feasts called, Israel is called to more feasts than it is to fast. But, to, but he said, go home and feast and rejoice and send uh, portions to your neighbors and to your friends because this is a day of rejoicing for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I think if there's any season we should be rejoicing in, it's the one where we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And so whatever it takes this season for you to tap in past all the stress and all the busyness and all the hosting of friends and loved ones, past all that, somehow, by the grace of God, tap in to the joy that is the undercurrent of all that this represents. If we miss that, then I think we've missed the purpose for the season. We were at an NEI gathering uh, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, something like that. And uh, a man spoke. I've never heard him speak before, but he pastors in Shreveport, Louisiana, Tim Carscadden. I believe is how you say his name. Close enough. And, uh, and he, his um, message was about the way this angel called the winds of change would come visit him and uh, he would have to minister uh, in ways this angel directed him and with the empowerment or what the angel would do to cause the ministry to be impactful. This was in uh, nations overseas and this angel brings changes to, to, to complete nations. And so as he was sharing that, he was, had such a sense of humor about it even though the challenge would almost cost him his life. I mean, he started one winds of chain, came while he was in the hotel in the country. He had to pay a cab driver to get him out of there because they were shooting the cab drivers. The overthrow the revolution and everything and, and got him to the airport and he got out of there. But he said, you know, you could have waited to bring the change until I was out of the country. And the angel doesn't seem to be too concerned about that. Apparently he can handle, you know, let the chips fall where they fall and he can handle it. And uh, the interesting thing was while he was sharing this and we were laughing and enjoying the testimonies, we were getting built up by the testimonies that we're not alone in, the, in our battles. There are angels that are our allies. And then also we were getting up, built up, I noticed, just by the laughter, just by the joy of how he was sharing what he was sharing. And I thought we can't miss out and we can't... Um, neglect to do some things just because they're fun. Now, some things that are fun, and now you need to have your fun redeemed. I, I'm, I'm not, there were some things I used to do for fun that I wouldn't do anymore, you know. They didn't end up being the ultimate result. It wasn't joy. But some things, redeemed fun can lay, uh, that can build up that, that uh, joy in our fuel tank. Because what I want to call this message today is refueling your joy tank. 
I want to use the word refueling because if the joy of the Lord is our strength, then I want us to realize we need the fuel of joy to run on as, as a necessity as much as our car needs gas in the tank for, its, for it to get us where we need to be. Well, for us to be where God intends us to be and do what He intends us to accomplish, we need to have something refueling our joy tank. Why? Because the joy of the Lord's our strength. And it, it comes down to something very, very uh, simple. And so there's many, many ways that this can uh, happen. But I, just in thinking about it, I thought, well, what are some of the ways that I know God uses for doing that? Now, remember... Uh, Paul told us that the kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's one-third of the characteristics of the kingdom of heaven. Also, the gifts of the Spirit, the second one of the nine that are listed is joy. So, I mean, not the gifts, the fruit of the Spirit. And so joy is prominent in what's supposed to be uh, evident in our lives, evident by what it causes to manifest. It can cause perseverance to manifest. Well, I don't know why you say you have joy. You're not laughing very much. Well, but here's the deal. I'm still standing. I'm still here. And a lot of people have fallen down. And a lot of people have quit the race. And so sometimes the strength is manifested in your perseverance and your endurance. But it's good to find things and get around people who can just stir up the lightheartedness that we need to have. I heard, you know, the old saying is, how can people know that you've uh, gotten saved and you've believed the, the good news of the gospel if you look like you've been baptized in pickle juice? You know, that was the old saying, you know, because vinegar makes you look like something other than joy has a hold of your life. But I want to give you five ways to refuel your joy tank when you're running on empty. And I don't think I'm speaking to just myself this morning, though I am speaking to myself that in this season we can certainly hit the empty level on the, on the joy tank. So the first one I would say uh, is uh, search out good news. And um, Proverbs 25, 25 says, As cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country, or good news for our country. And so uh, I get on, uh, we, we're on a prayer call five days a week that goes across the nation, and there's, uh, many people on there that uh, we don't know who's on there, but uh, sometimes it gets in the thousands and sometimes it's in the hundreds. But there's always somebody on there agreeing with us, and we get emails from people. Here's one I got last week. It says um, it's from a lady from, uh, in, uh, out of Illinois, and she says, uh, uh, Thank you, auto incorrect. I'll call it auto incorrect. Whenever it corrects me and I sends it out and I look at oh my goodness why auto incorrect has hit me again so she says dear mister herself because it corrected hurdle you know so um, dear mister herself I'm sure she was wanting to get that back but uh, <laughs> thank you so much for your always trying to give us positive news it shows us how God is moving and how we can praise him I truly appreciate all you do on these prayer calls at 222 praying for the whole team in him, and she gives her name. So uh, one of the things that she noticed is that when I read the news or when I watch the news, I'm trying to watch for what is being flagged to me. In other words, this is your assignment to pray for. There's a lot of negative news. You can choose it, and you can pray for it all if you want to. I don't have that kind of time, and I don't have the passion to pray for everything that's wrong in our nation. And I don't have the ability to do it. But sometimes when I'm just reading through things, the Lord will flag a certain item. And He'll say, you need to stop that B&B bill, that BBB bill. Uh, build back better thing. And so on the prayer call, I will make that a prayer emphasis. But as I'm looking at things and watching for the flags, I'm watching for the nuggets of good news embedded almost accidentally in the stories of negative news. And if you, can, if you can pick up on the good news, then you can pray out of Philippians 4, 6, where it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, with prayers, all kinds of prayers and supplications, with thanksgivings, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, 
which surpasses understanding will guard your heart and your mind. And so to have thanksgivings, I've got to pick up on some of the good news to keep my thanksgiving current and to keep it specific. And what I really watch for is answered prayer embedded in the news because sometimes it's not easy to see. And if you don't recognize that, hey, we were praying about this last week and we've already gotten an answer or we've, this answer is in process. And if you pick up on that, then you could step into a, a position where you can refuel the joy in your tank. It says in John 16, verse 24, Jesus says to his disciples, until now you have asked nothing in my name, asking you will receive that your joy may be full. But what if you've asked and you didn't pay attention enough to know you received? Or that you were so focused already on the other needs, the other concerns, that you didn't enjoy the fact that the prayer you prayed two weeks ago, a month ago, two years ago was answered. And so it's something we have to pay attention to or you will get drained just trying to be an intercessor and pray over the concerns that we face uh, in families and as individuals and churches and nations. So the second one is that uh, helps us refuel our joint, joy tank is uh, set up, I call it, I'll just use, say, it, say it this way, to set up triggers with God. Psalm 16 verse 8, David says, and this is speaking about the Messiah, but it applies, I'm sure it applied to his life too, but he said, I've set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. And so David did something uh, where he made a decision that he was going to be able to discern the Lord at his right hand or discern the Lord's presence was with him in any situation. And so my conviction is God wants to communicate with us so much that he will honor the things we will use to communicate with Him just to get the ball rolling. And we will have to learn the, ways, the variety of ways that He communicates. But I said one time, Lord, when I see 333, I'm going to think of Jeremiah 33.3. Call on me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not. And I began to see 333. Every time I turned my head. I mean, I saw it like more in one year than I had my whole life. Because he said, I'll honor that. You want to communicate with me? I'll give you a 333. I said, well, what about 222? I like that because it talks about Jesus being the, um, um, confirmed as uh, the miracle working Son of God in Acts chapter 2, verse 22. And so I said, Lord, when I see that, you know, and so, and, we got, and so the digital clocks and the digital readouts give us so many opportunities to say, Lord, when I see that, I'm going to see it as you uh, confirming at least your presence is with me. It doesn't have to necessarily mean a specific direction, but it can mean my, my fingerprints are on this. And you get enough fingerprints, you'll see his whole hand is on it. And you get his hand on it, then you can move in confidence and uh, much confidence. But uh, again, I'll give Holly credit. I have to because years ago, I think we were still at the, we were still at the Baptist church, and she would say she saw two dimes, you know, uh, in whatever place, and I noticed she, and it meant something to her, and so um, meant a scripture, meant, meant, a, meant the Lord was saying something, and so then, uh, and I thought I'll be, and I've told this before, but I, I thought at the time I was in the Baptist church. I loved the Word of God, loved the Scripture. I had a Scripture for everything. I thought, why can't that woman just think in scriptures? What a, why, why does she have to, why does she have to use dimes? Uh, why not just the Word of God speaking to us? You know, I read in my Bible, I opened it here, and it was saying this. But, but what happened was, she said, you know, um, I let when I see a penny, I let it mean that I'm one cent. I'm in the right place, at the right time, doing the right thing with the right people. And I said, well, Lord, that sounds pretty good to me. I want to, I want to do that. When I see a penny, I'm going to let it speak to me, turn my attention to you, and let it give me confidence. I began to see pennies in the most unusual places, stuck in the bark of a tree. I mean, just crazy stuff. And I'd go, thank you, Lord. I, you don't know how much I was just struggling with whether I should be coming up to this door or knocking on this door or whether I should 
be going to this conference or not, and yet, and yet here you're giving us confirmation through a trigger that I've set up with God so it would trigger in me a, 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 a focus on God and what, it, what is He saying to me and that He's there with me at the time. I remember Matt Lockett when he had a dream and this is how God speaks to us and we can't neglect the way He, he uh, according to the Scripture, speaks to us but he had a dream about a man and uh, I can't remember what they were doing but he knew the name of the man but he never met the man but the dream had the name in it. His na the man's name was Lou Engel. So he didn't know what the man was even what he did but he called the he looked him up in the phone book and he called his called the number and the guy answered and he said uh, my name's Matt Lockett he said I had a dream about you he said I don't know why he said what do you do he said well I run Justice House of Prayer in Washington D.C. and Matt said well I've been uh, I've been uh, you know really burdened for this abortion issue you want to see our nation delivered of it and Lou said, okay. And he said, but I don't know why, you know, I had, had uh, your face in a dream with your name. And uh, Lou said, I know why. And he said, why is that? He said, you're supposed to come to Washington, D.C. and work with me. I think he was living in Florida or somewhere and had a, a, a um, successful business. His wife was working somewhere. And he said, well, I, that's pretty, whew, that's a stretch. I had a dream and now I'm supposed to go to Washington and work with this guy I don't even know, you know. And so I need confirmation. And so... He called his wife, and he said, uh, he told her the story, and uh, he said, this guy said he thinks we're supposed to move to Washington and work with him. And she, he heard her at the other end of the line go, oh, my goodness. And he said, well, I'm sorry. What would what, you, I didn't mean to startle you. And she said, no, as soon as you said that, a car pulled in front of me. I'm driving, and on the, the car tag, it said, go, go D.C. Go D.C., that's what it said. And so being sensitive to how God will speak to us they took that as confirmation what was that 16 years ago and now they've been leading Justice House of Prayer which freed, freed Lou up to do other things but it's, it's a way that uh, triggered uh, them hearing God and, um, and we know that it comes out of Proverbs 25 too, where he says the glory of God to conceal matter glory of kings to search it out we've got to be sensitive and search it out at times but that joy that's stirred up when we have uh, tapped in to his presence um, because we've searched out is his hand here is his hand here is his presence where's his presence at am I on the right track think of the contrast between uh, Luke twelve thirty two. do not fear little flock for it's your father's good pleasure to just give you the kingdom Contrast that with Matthew 6.33. You seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and it, all these other things will be added to you. Wait a minute, I thought you were just going to give it to us. Well, He is, but you've got to look for it because He's got this thing where He wants you to want what He wants to give you. You say, well, I don't want it enough to look for it. He says, then you won't find it because I want those who value it, who will seek it, who will look for it, I want them to be the ones that gain uh, the kingdom to themselves. So set up triggers with God and see if that doesn't help you as you navigate through uh, difficult seasons and even just life in general. Third one, sensitize your heart. Psalm 32, 8 uh, says, I will instruct you. David speaking, the Lord speaking to him, I will instruct you, I will teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. How sensitive do you have to be to pick up on the eye of the Lord? How sensitized does your heart have to be to know that he's looking at you the way your dad used to look at you across the table when you should have said please or thank you when you asked them to pass the butter or whatever. <laughs> you remember that sideways look? that you knew that if you didn't obey, you were in trouble? Remember the ones you used to give your kids? Not just disciplinary, but Dad, what do I do now? And all he does is go. We have to have a sensitive heart to pick up on the eye of the Lord. But he goes on to say in that passage, uh, that same psalm, he goes on to say, don't be like the mule and the horse that have to have a bridle on 
for them to be directed to where I want them to go or to where you want them to go. Be sensitive. Let your heart be sensitive, sensitized, so that you'll pick up on what I'm directing you to. And so when he highlights a path for you to take, and you're on that, and you're walking that path, I just want to say this because in case some of you thought it was all fun and games. I don't think there's any of you here. <laughs> But when you're on that path of life, generally, that, and usually, when he directs you down a path or to walk in a path, it involves a dying to self. You say, well, that doesn't sound like joy. For the cross, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus had to do it, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. He said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to take up your cross. You're going to have to deny yourself. If we can't do that, if we can't say, I really, my will is, or I, I really want to do this. And the Father says, I know, I know, I know, but this is what I have for you. And if you can't make the decision to take his path when it crosses your path, if you can't take up the cross where his will crosses yours, then you'll miss out on the joy that was on the other side of that. So sometimes there's a dying to self involved before there is the joy. It says in um, Psalm 51 where David the prodigal, David had been a prodigal from the presence of God. He had, he'd been in sin and the prophet had confronted him. And he says to the Lord, as he repented and came back, he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, sensitize my heart. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. He said, look, I need your presence. I need your Holy Spirit. I need your joy restored to me. I've walked away from it, but I'm asking for it back. Well, he got it back. His repentance was sincere and he got it back. Fourth thing, stir up joy in others. You say, yeah, I need more joy than stir it up in others. Hebrews 10, 24 says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Christmas season is a time where you give gifts. And in giving of those gifts, all of you are mature enough, I know, to know how the joy that's stirred up when you do that. When you make someone else happy, how that stirs up your own joy. Well, consider that you have the gifts of the Spirit to give all year round. And that when you give a gift of the Spirit or flow in a gift of the Spirit to bless someone else's life, their joy can increase your joy. Or the fact that you even took that risk, and, uh, and at least they know God loves them and is concerned, that can stir up your joy. Joe and I were in Ramey's a couple weeks ago, and uh, a lady came up that we had met years ago, years ago. And she began to tell us what she was battling, some, uh, something called POTS disease. And um, hadn't heard of it before, but it causes you to f have fainting spells uh, at random times. It causes you to be weak and fatigued. It has something to do with your heart not supplying the blood it should. She was being treated by doctors that had it several uh, long times. She, she was not allowed to drive. She was miserable. And I said, well, let's, let us pray for you. And so we laid hands on her there in Ramey's and we prayed for her and uh, believed God for her healing. Nothing manifested at that moment. And, uh, but she went away from there appreciating that we cared enough to pray. We go into Dickie's last Sunday morning to eat lunch. And this woman uh, approaches us and is profusely thanking us for praying for her. She can drive. She has her strength back. The fatigue is gone. Whatever the doctors are doing is working. I'm sure they're probably still doing something. It wasn't clear. But she's completely, as far as what she was saying to us, restored. And she's so happy. She's so joyful. Guess what Joe and I did? We got some joy in our tank. We got some fuel in our tank from this lady's joy. And so these are, when you've got the gifts of the Spirit, don't neglect to use them and pour them out on others. Listen to this passage, Acts 8 verses 7 and 8. For unclean spirits, the disciples went down to Samaria 
Uh, when Stephen was killed and persecution started, they just went down to Samaria and started preaching the gospel. It says, For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that whole city. Well, that means the ones doing the ministry were probably getting pretty joyful too. They were seeing people get set free, and they were getting, they were getting joy. So the fifth one, last one, stay connected practically and spiritually where God has you connected. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as this is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. There's a fuller joy that comes from gathering face to face than you get from the TV. Thank God for technology. Thank God that we can stream things and that we can get the message out that way. But there's a fuller joy that comes from gathering together. Listen to this. Um, John says in 2 John 1, verse tw uh, chapter 1, verse 12, Having many things to write you, I did not wish to do so. I didn't want to communicate with you in another means than, than, than actually being there. He would say today, having a, a video I could have sent you, I, w I would rather not. I wish I would rather not do it that way. He says, so I, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face with you that our joy may be full. That's pretty clear, isn't it? I know that I saw people at the wedding yesterday that I haven't seen in a long time. You know, COVID caused us to isolate, and then we got busy and other things, and there were people with both those families that go back a ways that I haven't seen for a long time, and I was very happy and joyful to see them and, uh, and fellowship with them and just uh, shake their hand and hug their neck and uh, it was just good because I was seeing him face to face. She said, well, I, Joe could have said, well, I showed you a picture of him yesterday. That's not the same. That's, well, you watched him on a video last, I told Dutch, two weeks ago, we were with him at the uh, NEI conference. I said, man, I appreciate getting to watch you on TV every, every morning. Uh, give him 15. If you're not on that, if you, that's not an app you can get on, it'll bless you. It's 15 minutes to start your day with a focus on the Lord. Dutch uh, is faithful to do that. I said, I appreciate seeing you every morning on television. I said, but sure is good to see you face to face. He said, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's a difference. People need to realize that who have uh, pulled back and got in the habit of saying, well, I'll just get it on TV or I'll just get it on the, on the streaming. And uh, you can, you can get blessed. You can learn a lot. But there's a fuller joy that comes when you rub sh shoulder to shoulder and you see face to face and you get to um, gain an impartation from somebody that you may not have gained, just you wouldn't have gained e even at all on a video or on TV. So Romans 15, 13, I'll close with this and uh, we'll have a, uh, a glorious week of having our joy refueled because of this. Romans 15, 13, Paul prayed for the church. He said, now may the God of hope, that would be our God, wouldn't it? Because we're in hope. We're, we belong to hope. We belong to hope fellowship. It says the God of hope, thankfully, it's also the God of the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I just want to, uh, why don't you stand with me? And I um, appreciate that song we opened with, Bobby. It was so joyful. And uh, one day I'll see the words, but <laughs> see what we were singing, but it was sure joyful. <laughs> but the God of hope, He said, I'm going to give you joy and peace I'm just going to ask you to do one little thing, he said. You're going to have to believe I'll do it. You're going to have to believe he'll do it. I'm just going to go for it. Because the other way doesn't work that well. You know, the stuff we deal with, the stuff we learn, the activation part of it 
requires us to believe it. You didn't know that? Well, that's why you're not getting anywhere. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. He said, I'm going to give you all kinds of joy and peace in your believing. And we're just going to believe God that we're going to have a week where we get a profound refueling of our joy tank. And he said that you might abound in hope. There's something about joy and hope that's connected. And I know a lot of people right now that they know enough, they've walked with the Lord enough, they really should have more hope than they've got, but they've gotten hit. I'm not going to condemn them. They've gotten hit over and over. They've gotten hit with things they didn't know were coming. And they're having to process it and deal with it, but they're going to have to believe that there's a God in heaven that wants to fill them with all joy and peace in their believing. And so, Lord, today, we say as a body, we believe you, that you will impart to us something we can't get on our own. We can believe. We can make the decision to believe. But we need you to give us joy and peace and that we might abound because of that in hope. And so we pull it in to our hearts. We pull it into our joy tank by saying today, we believe you, God. We believe you're able. We believe you're willing. We believe you desire to do it more than we even uh, want to pay the price to receive it. But we choose today to believe God. The next time you see someone in this church, one of the things I want you to say to them, to remind them of what I just said and what we just decided. Just say, how you doing? I'm believing God. How you doing? I'm believing God. How about you? Yeah. Hey, Philip, I'm believing God. How about you? <laughs> I know you. <laughs> Do it. Stir it up. Stir each other up. Consider one another. You might stir each other up to love and good work. I'm believing God. How about you? And at that moment, they might be going, how am I going to get my car fixed? And they go, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm believing God too. It'll help them. It'll help me. Do it to me. Father, we thank you. We receive the joy and the peace and the hope that comes when we declare we're believing God. We'll give you the praise for this season we're in. Work out all the details. Work out all the big stuff. Take away the straws that broke the camel's back. And Lord, we'll just give you praise and honor and glory that we have a grace to walk in this season and enjoy the joy that it was supposed to impart as we celebrate the birth of your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Your people agreed and said amen. Amen. God bless you.